is a game that's consumed so much of my life recently that I felt I should make a video on it. There's something about 4X games in general that really absorbed me. Maybe it's something about subjugating an entire people neath my mighty tread. Anyway, this is Stellaris, a space civilization management sim brought to us by Paradox Interactive. You take control of an empire making its first forays into interstellar travel. First things first, you have to pick the spacefaring empire that you'll be leading into greatness, and the variety on offer at first seems pretty impressive. By default there's two human factions, lizard Nazis, bird buddhists, hermit crabs, science squids, bureaucratic fungi, and even weird sloth platypus people. In addition to these, there's also an extensive faction creator with additional traits, government types, and portraits to choose from. Or you can just randomise everything, which is how the game populates the galaxy with other civilizations. Despite this appearance of choice and variety, most of these differing factions end up playing exactly the same. For example, even if you play a faction with the pacifist trait, and so are supposedly adverse to fighting and wars, there isn't much stopping you from building a huge armada and steamrolling over everyone, apart from a very small happiness penalty. The differences between the factions that seem to make the most difference are the different methods of interstellar travel, which somewhat act as a flat difficulty modifier for your game, and what type of weapons the faction starts off using. Something I do quite like is how your empire's personality traits affect and influence your reaction to and the rewards you get from random events. Like a spiritual empire will gain happiness from a meteor shower passing over its homeworld, whilst a more scientific leaning empire will note the event as having no significance. This does extend to what greetings you can offer rival empires you encounter, However, from what I can tell, whichever greeting you choose doesn't affect your standing with your rival, which I feel was a real missed opportunity. Even if giving a response that aligned or contradicted with other Empire's traits only gave a very small change in your standing with them, positive or negative, it'd be a welcome bit of flavour, which the game otherwise seems to be relying on. Diplomacy overall is a bit basic. Your standing with any given empire is pretty much decided from the start entirely by your empire's philosophies, and it can be tough to mitigate these differences through trade or diplomacy, so there's very little that you can do beyond exterminating any of those who oppose you, which is especially troublesome with so-called stagnant ascendancies, which are meant to be ancient empires in decline, and so have the best militaries and best technology. So if one does take a disliking to you for whatever reason, you may as well kiss your cosmic ambitions goodbye. Gameplay happens in real time, by default at one day per second, rather than being turn-based. This way of time passing does help give a sense of scale to the game, with actions like travelling between stars taking in-game months. In single player, you can speed this game time up, or slow it down, or pause it at will if there's either too much or not enough to keep you busy. I'm given to understand that in multiplayer you're able to pause during a session, but the game speed is constant and agreed by everyone at the start. As time goes on, of course, your ships, colonies, and government all have to be upgraded, which means technology. And how they've done the tech tree baffles me somewhat. There are three tech trees you research simultaneously, which I like. It's something that's always somewhat bothered me in 4X games, where your entire empire can only focus on one thing at a time. What I don't like, however, is that when you are researching a new tech, you can only choose from three or four semi-random alternatives and it gives you different choices every time you need to pick a tech from a given tech tree, leading to the bizarre situation where you're able to research an option, but if you don't choose to immediately, you might not get the chance again until after you've researched three or four techs to reset the random number generator. One exemption from this is any tech that you can get from analysis of combat debris, which, if you've made any progress to it, you'll be able to research it. If you win a space battle, you can analyse the debris remaining, and if the people or creatures you were fighting had a technology you didn't. For instance, if they were using lasers when you were using missiles, then you'll get some progress towards the research of lasers. Combat overall has the promise of depth to it, with several different weapons and defence types you can equip your ships with. Every weapon has strengths and weaknesses against different defences, so in theory you can counter the type of ships your opponent is building, and to an extent this is the case. However, in practice, because in the early game you won't have access to all the different weapon and defence types, it's pretty impossible to effectively counter build without a lot of luck in terms of your tech choices. Thus, in general, it boils down to whoever built the most and highest tech ships wins, with little to no ability to recover if your fleet or death stack is destroyed by an opponent, and no ability for them to recover if you destroy theirs. I do quite like the way wars overall are dealt with though, because when you declare war, you issue war demands to your enemy, and this can range anywhere from 
I just want to humiliate you, to give me your entire empire's territory. And this dictates essentially how long the war will go on for, as opponents will fight harder against you the more demands you issue. There's also a running war score giving a nice visual shorthand indication of how close the enemy is to admitting defeat or outright destroying you. You've also got science ships that can help you survey new worlds or combat debris, and bravely go forth into the unknown, finding anomalies, which, along with the randomly generated events, can give your empire science or industry bonuses. These random events are varied enough that they'll generally only repeat themselves after multiple games, apart from the couple that are set to happen every game. You also have to hire your empire's important leaders who can research your technologies and take charge of your science ships, or help govern your planets and space sectors, or even lead your armadas and command your ground troops. Depending on your government type, they can also be raised to be your empire's figurehead leader, giving you empire-wide bonuses, and as time passes, if they've not fallen in combat, they will age and finally die, having to be replaced. Again, giving a sense of scale as generations come and go. Overall, I don't really know whether or not to recommend Stellaris. There seems to be a wall in every game after initial exploration and expansion phase where the game descends into tedious micromanagement and waiting. To my shame, I've yet to experience the late game because I very rarely want to go back to a game after leaving it. And considering the only victory conditions in the game at this point are two variations of conquer all other factions, the combat boils down to biggest army wins and even the smallest maps have 150 star systems, you can see how it might not be enthusing to see a game through. And yet the early game is really quite fun and really delivers on the fantasy of you building a galactic empire. It's just a shame it can't carry it through to the end. Stellaris is £35 on Steam or a similar amount of your local currency? As I said, it's tough for me to recommend a game that I've not really seen through to the end yet, so make of that what you will. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, feel free to leave a comment down below. There's also thumbs up and down beneath the video that you can use as appropriate, and I'll see you in the near future.